I'm Mark Ramsey. I am so excited to have with me my good friend and somebody I actually, he doesn't know this, but I consider him a mentor of sorts, um, Barry Drake. Barry is the author of this book, 40 Years, 40,000 Sales Calls. We're going to talk about it in this uh, segment. Thoughts on Radio and Advertising Based on a Lifetime of Customer Contact, which is a great title, Barry. Barry is uh, the uh, man who formed Backyard Broadcasting. And prior to Backyard, he was the CEO of television for Sinclair Broadcast Group, CEO of radio for Sinclair, and president and COO of Key Market Communications and uh, COO for radio at River City Broadcasting. Really an illustrious history, Barry, and I'm so thrilled to have you. Great to be here, Mark. Always good to see you, even if it is only electronically. Only electronically, but not not for long. <laughs> that we know. Um, you know, you're somebody that everybody in the radio space knows, and I'm really kind of intrigued and excited that you wrote this book, 40 Years, 40,000 Sales Calls. I guess my first question, even before the why did you write this question, is the 40,000 really, Barry? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the original version, there was an entire section devoted to the math, <laughs> which... <laughs> my, Which is always a big hit, by the way, for readers. My wonderful editor said, nobody cares about <laughs> that. Nobody cares how you got to the number. Forget about all that. And it is the first question I get from everybody. Oh, was great. it really 40,000 or was it 38,982? I, I can't believe I came up with the same first question. Now, you said that your editor advised you not to do the math. When you, you and I last spoke about this book, your ed editor advised you to leave out another part of the book that I thought was particularly uh, cool and important. And that is kind of the, the beginnings of Barry Drake um, as a kid in an environment where American Bandstand and things influenced by American Bandstand were just uh, coming into popular culture. Can you talk about that? Well, sure. I, uh, I started the book with uh, actually uh, uh, a little bit before I was born, uh, but I thought it was important because I, I had a, a special opportunity, and that was to grow up in a media household. Uh, my father was uh, uh, started in radio, got into television, went back into radio, had a terrific career as a morning man for many, many years. And uh, my mother, although she retired when I was born, uh, was a radio copywriter. And um, it was her job to uh, write the commercials for the uh, local clients and uh, to actually go see them personally so that she would know what to write about. And um, that certainly uh, formed why I feel the way I do about so many things. It wasn't any kind of... Uh, uh, formal home education, but just being in that environment made such a big difference. So I thought it was important for uh, uh, to give uh, to give me an opportunity to uh, to let people know why I think the way I do about so many things, and also uh, because it was a time when uh, you know you had radio, and then early on, right after I was born, television came into play. Uh, we were the only people on our block that had a television set for a while because uh, Dad would bring one home from uh, the studio. They'd, they'd lend it to him for the night. We could watch whatever was on. He'd take it back the next day. But the neighbors would all come over to watch this thing, this new thing called television. And then, of course, uh, as time went on, it became color TV, and then it was uh, then cable uh, became a big deal, and then it was FM. And so there's always been this uh, evolution of uh, technology that uh, makes media more interesting, more competitive, and uh, more entertaining, of course, uh, to the audience. And uh, I thought that was important to go back and, and look at that simply to be able to put everything into perspective. Well, uh, and, th and that's my question, I guess. What, so what? So there were all these things, and they had an impact on you. And what was that impact? Characterize well, that for me. The impact is really that now, as we're hearing about new technology every minute of the day and new ways of uh, experiencing entertainment and getting information, I look at that and say, yeah, so what? I mean, this is the way it is. This is It's always going to be that way. Maybe it happens faster now. Maybe it's uh, more immediate and maybe you hear about it. Uh, uh, you know, like I said, we were the only uh, folks on the block with a, a television for a while. Uh, today, you hear about something new and it's, uh, it's out there and people are using it right away. But uh, I think what, what this all comes back to is that the basic foundation while the technology and the means of uh, receiving and transmitting 
entertainment mm -hmm. and information may change, the basic idea, the basic foundation, the basic connection between listeners and audience, viewers and audience, and ultimately the advertisers and the audience, that basic foundation is the same as when my mom went out to the women's clothing store to ask what copy they wanted to run that week and, and what they wanted to put in their uh, commercial uh, on the radio station. So I think those things haven't really changed. How we do them and what's available to us uh, certainly uh, can change and has changed and will continue to change. Uh, but the basic ideas and the fundamentals and what the listeners are looking for and what the advertisers are looking for, they're pretty much the same. They really are. I mean, if you were starting your career now, and I, don't, I didn't prep you with this question, so I'm going to be interested to see if you have an answer ready. But if you were starting your career now in media, um, what direction do you think you'd take? If I were starting now, if I could go back, if I were 20 years old today. Yes, I was starting today. That that is a great question because I think it's one that uh, uh, really really gets to where we are today. And uh, specifically, I've had this conversation about the radio with with a lot of people in terms of you know what what does radio have to do today to continue to be relevant is is mm -hmm. the big question. And I think back again to what happened back in the mid 60s now rock and roll radio was still in and was already in progress but but there was a new wave of rock and roll radio that was coming along in the mid 60s called boss radio mm -hmm. and it was the modernization of uh the top 40 music format uh there were there had been rock and roll in the radio, top 40 on the radio, but the mid-60s uh, uh, rendition of it was, was a modernization of it. And what was interesting to me, and I use uh, WFIL in Philadelphia as an example because I was familiar with it because of its uh, proximity to where I grew up. Well, the owner of WFIL was Walter Annenberg who owned uh, the Triangle Publications, Philadelphia Inquirer, had some radio stations around the country and uh, some television stations as well. He had owned WFIL for quite a while, and uh, the station hadn't really been a, a leader in the market. So he decided he wanted to go Boss Radio, Top 40. The pop explosion came mm -hmm. to WFIL in Philadelphia. And Walter Annenberg was 58 years old at the time, 1966. But he decided he wanted to get this baby boom generation. Now, he didn't sit down in the PD's office and make up a playlist. Mm -hmm. He hired guys who were 25, 27, 28, 29 years old, and they created the radio station. Now, there was a general manager there for adult supervision, of course, but, <laughs> but the the young guys came in and made this radio station because they knew what the baby boomers wanted. They knew the music, they knew how to execute this format, they knew how to talk to baby boomers, they knew how to say what the baby boomers would relate to. Now, remember, the oldest, ba the oldest baby boomer at that time was 20 years old. So, mm -hmm. again, just to put it into perspective, so I think, you know, in, th in thinking about, you know, what would I do today if I were 20 years old or 25 years old and getting into the business, I'd be looking for an opportunity where someone had the vision, mm -hmm. as Walter Annenberg did, the ability to make a specific direction. He didn't say, uh, I want to have a successful station. He said, no, get me this demographic. This is where it's going. This is what I want very specific direction. And he had the resources to make it happen. He said, I know it's going to take a few years before mm -hmm. this thing really turns around and becomes profitable. I'm not worried about that. Let's put the team together. You guys do it. Make it sound great. And I'll be happy. And he was. It's and interesting. He it's interesting that what you're alluding to, what you're suggesting is that you know, more participation from the target you want will increase the odds of you capturing the attention and interest of that target, right? And I've, of 
I've often wondered why, for example, I, I was just talking to the guys at a site called Movie Pilot uh, a few days ago. Movie Pilot's a site that uh, does a lot of has a lot of traction through Facebook. They and it's all about movies primarily and about cult movies and niche movies and horror movies and sci-fi movies and you know comic book movies. But they um, told me the average age in their office, which is in Venice, California, by the way, is 24. And the old man on the call was 29. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I think there's something to that. And I'm often struck by, by that. I'm often struck by the fact that what you want is very often not, d doesn't include the opinions of the people you want. I've been in conference rooms dealing with top 40 stations where people from across a group gather and every single one of them is a white guy in his 50s. <laughs> and... <laughs> Not that there's anything yeah. wrong with that, I can say, as well, a white guy in my 50s. But, uh, you know, and likewise, when we talk about what appeals to women and we talk to women in a survey, but we actually don't have any women in the room, it's it's a very strange thing. And I've often wondered why there's not more participation from people who are the target rather than people who are talking about the target. Well, I think we're to blame. Uh, uh, baby boomers are to blame. And... Uh, uh, the old white guys like me are to blame uh, because what happened, and it's not just in, in radio, it's not just in media, it's, it's uh, as, you, as you mentioned, in other fields, and, and it really goes out into, uh, into the marketplace in general, uh, that um, entitled generation of baby boomers doesn't want to give up, doesn't want to let anybody play uh, the game in the sandbox. And unfortunately, uh, what also has happened is, unlike a Walter Annenberg, who had built already built a big company and a multimedia company and had the resources to do it, that's another area where we're lacking today. Uh, I mention in the book that the radio companies today aren't big enough. And I don't mean that in that they need to have more radio stations. That, that wouldn't solve anything. What I mean is when you look back over time when, the, um, when, when great innovation and invention took place in radio, the radio stations were owned by large companies that could invest and had the resources to make that happen. When you go back to the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s and the early days of when FM uh, uh, came along and really became a, a commercially uh, viable and, and the listening shifted to FM, I mean, the radio stations were owned by big companies, ABC, NBC, CBS, of course. Right. And then you had General Tire, uh, General Cinema Corporation, uh, Shearing Plow, uh, Metromedia, of course. Uh, so... At, at, at that time, the, the radio stations were really a, a smaller part of a, of a much larger company, but could be supported by that large company when innovation had to take place, when change had to take place, when promotion had to take place. And um, that we don't really have today. Um, it, it all changed, of course, and the radio, the radio companies, the, the large ones, the, the four, five, six large ones are, are big companies uh, in, in radio. Uh, but that's it. So they're really strapped. Uh, they, they really can't make the kinds of uh, investments and, and unfortunately don't have the resources the way it's set up now to, uh, uh, to bring in young people and say, okay, here's, here's a station. Get me the millennials. Mm -hmm. get me, you get me the young millennials. You get me the older millennials. Let's let's. But, but isn't that strategy. fundamentally a trap? I mean, in the sense that if you can't invest in things like talent and, you know, content and resources and, and things to power talent, if, if fundamentally we're getting to a space where, you know, the content and the talent which creates that content drives all the attention, which drives the interest, which drives the usage, which attracts the dollars, which creates the profits, that is the time we're in, then... Doesn't that mean that traditional broadcasters are in a trap? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, particularly the the uh, large 
in the large markets. Uh, smaller companies and smaller markets, it's, it's really a bit of a different game, and uh, uh, they're doing much better and uh, well, talk uh, able, about to, that. able to do some different things. Talk about that. Why is that uh, because, different? Why is that different? Because in a, a smaller market, and uh, I experienced this with, with backyard broadcasting, in the smaller markets, radio is Broadway, Hollywood, and radio and television all put together. It's, mm -hmm. it's the big show. And the resources to make that happen uh, are, are necessary, but they're not nearly as large as what it takes to compete for attention in larger markets, mm -hmm. uh, just because of the competitive landscape. So uh, radio operators and uh, stations in, uh, in the smaller markets uh, have, have really held a position of prominence and continue to. And this enables their business to be much stronger, much more predictable. It, 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 it grows outside. I mean, in the years with backyard broadcasting, we always outgrew the numbers that you would hear for the, uh, uh, for the country as a whole uh, uh, in terms of uh, percentage growth rates. And uh, we were able to do it again because we were, uh, we were uh, the big show in town and we had direct contact with many of our advertisers. Uh, the advertising base was different in that uh, two-thirds of it was uh, done directly with the advertisers. There was no middleman agency involved in two-thirds of our business. So that made a big difference as well because we were able to sell our value and we were able to work directly with the advertiser on the campaigns and able to track results with them and satisfy their needs. Mm -hmm. So as you project out you know, five years, w w what do you see changing? How do you see the people in the business of entertaining through radio, through audio? How do you see that world evolving over, over five years? Well, I think uh, something's got to happen, uh, and I think it, uh, it will. As I say, you know, radio's not dead. Radio's not going away. The connection between radio and listeners is, is a beautiful thing, and it's, it, it works so wonderfully. Uh, uh, that that's not going to go away, but radio today is on a plateau, and and it's dangerous to be on a plateau for too long a period of time, mm -hmm. particularly when there's so many other things coming our way, and so many other opportunities for people to uh, experience uh, what they want to experience, entertainment wise or information wise. So radio is going to need to. Uh, to, to in order to have a bright future, get off the plateau and grow. Uh, radio is going to have to see investment, and that's going to mean new ownership coming into the business. If, if mm -hmm. that's going to happen, um, as I say, when when the when the large companies owned radio stations, the opportunity for investment innovation was there, and that's got to happen again. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think we'll uh, I think we'll see that. So um, in the book, you indicated to me that <clears throat> some of the principles in 40 years, 40,000 sales calls were already being used, or should I say borrowed, by people who have read the book. Um, <laughs> can you talk about, give me, give me an example of some of the things, some of the, some of the best nuggets that people are out there using. Well, you know, what I, I hear from uh, 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 people uh, in the business, and uh, they talk about uh, using the book to work with their salespeople. And th there are you know, lots of little things that, that can turn a salesperson's attention and, and to get them thinking about it. Uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to get to see a decision maker, how to do it, what to say to them when it happens, to realize, first of all, that it's possible and, and that you really can get to the top and see the people who make the decisions who really are behind all the decisions uh, being made. Uh, but there's also uh, a number of stories in the book about dealing with uh, media buyers at, at, uh, at advertising agencies. And, um, you know, remembering that uh, they're people too. I mean, they've got an agenda and they've got a ton of work to do every day and they've got to turn out these buys and make them right and satisfy their uh, superiors inside the agency. And, um, you know, those kinds of things are uh, important to understand. And, and we talk in the book about, you know, how to, uh, how to, how to help uh, the relationship between uh, uh, an advertising buyer and, uh, 
a uh, and a radio salesperson at the same time. Uh, we also talk about uh, the competitive nature of television, and I uh, was able to do that not only from being in a, a medium selling against television for many, 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 many years, but then also being in a, a television company that uh, uh, gave me the um, opportunity to see it from their side and also see how the advertisers react to television. Uh, one of the uh, the things that I remember when I first got into television and talking with the salespeople there, and of course you you hear all about you know how tough it is to make sales, and you hear that no matter what business you're in, uh, because it is tough to make sales. Uh, but uh, uh, so I'm not I'm not disputing that. But but the uh, my comeback to the to the television salespeople, as I said, look after I I'd already been in radio for twenty some years at that time. I said after being in radio for twenty years and selling radio against television, I can tell you. Everybody wants to be on television. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not going to hear that you can't sell television <laughs> after being on the other side all those years. And know? that hasn't changed, I don't think, <laughs> by the way. Um, no, it hasn't. Um, it's evident to me from, from reading the book that this is the work of someone who is really happy with where their life has carried them and where their career has carried them. Am I reading that right? Is that true? I uh, have been very, very blessed, very fortunate uh, in, in many, many ways, uh, professionally, personally. I'm a lucky guy. Um, I know you wrote this in part to support uh, a charitable cause. Can you talk about that? Well, yes. Uh, all the net proceeds go to the Broadcasters Foundation of America, which is a uh, wonderful charity that uh, helps broadcasters uh, in need. Uh, many older uh, broadcasters, of course, who uh, have been in the business many, many years, and uh, uh, the industry is um, is uh, not one for having uh, uh, pension plans and uh, giving retirement uh, programs that include um, your health insurance for the rest of your life. So uh, it, it's really a worthwhile cause, and I'm glad you brought that up because it uh, uh, it really uh, makes a big difference when uh, when and I, I did it for two reasons. I said first of all, we'll we'll, we'll raise some money uh, doing this, and uh, at the same time, though, we'll heighten the awareness of uh, of the foundation among people who are maybe just getting into radio for the first time or into television for the first time and aren't really aware of it. Uh, the the foundation gets tremendous support from uh, the group heads and uh, uh, the groups in both radio and television uh, but I think it's important too to, to you know get the young people involved and and that was so much a part of my motivation for writing the book was you know being in being in these radio and television stations uh, and particularly the last uh, several years of being in radio stations and 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 watching the young people begin to question themselves about what they were doing and is there a future here and uh, is everything I'm hearing about you know coming out of the sky going to impact me how's it going to impact me and and I wanted to say hey look if you stay focused on the basics and practice your craft and get close to your clients and figure out how to help them this is a great way to do it because the the medium will perform if you give it the right direction, uh, the medium will, will do the job and uh, make your, your clients happy and give you a, a great, uh, great future. I, uh, I, I remembered and, and I told the story about uh, uh, when I was a 28 or 29 year old salesman and my client said to me, I feel for you because you're going to have to find a new way to make a living. <laughs> and this was 1979. <laughs> His concern was that with cassette decks going into cars, there'd be no radio audience uh -huh. anymore and he would have to take his business elsewhere and I'd be... <laughs> I'd be on the street without a <laughs> without a, a briefcase. So, uh, so I think about that story. I think, wow, you know, we've always, again, we've always had this technological mm -hmm. evolution, and uh, that was a great example of it back in 1979. So, uh, uh, we're here today, and uh, we can still be here tomorrow uh, when we adhere to the basics. And uh, uh, I wanted to try and put all the all the noise into perspective and say over a 40 year period and even longer if you go back to when I was a kid these are all the things that happened and uh, look where we are and look what we can do and uh, look what we still can do 
Uh, and uh, it's a great future for anybody who wants to devote themselves to it and, uh, and is uh, willing to do the work. You got to do the work. And uh, when you do the work, things, good things will happen. Barry Drake is, among so many other things, the author of 40 years, 40,000 sales calls available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and anywhere else uh, where you can order a book. Right, Barry? Amazon.com is uh, my publisher. I worked with them to, uh, to get it done. That's the easiest way to do it. I know you can do it through BarnesandNoble.com as well. So Who uh, does that? But whatever, who does that? I don't know. But uh, it works, and it's available in book as Mark is holding, and also in Kindle now. So uh, if that's your thing, you can get it electronically as well. It's not as easy to hold up the Kindle version, I'll tell you. <laughs> Barry is, uh, as I said, the author of this book, and also one of the true class acts of the radio and television industry. Barry, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. And I'll see you at Hyvio in June. I'll be there.